Alright everybody, welcome back. This is going to be a long chapter, but it's probably one of the most important chapters that you're going to encounter in the book. So if you guys just try to pay attention, bear with me and we'll get through this as quick as we can. Uh, basically, oxygenation and respiration are the kind of the things that we go by working in pre-hospital care. So we have to worry about respiration, the system in itself, airway assessment and management. We're going to go over some techniques on how to do artificial ventilation as well, some kind of some special, con special considerations that you're going to see out there in the field that you may encounter that we might be like, well, how do I put oxygen on this kind of a person? Well, we're going to discuss a few of those things, all right? Um, an open airway is known as a patent airway. Basically, it's open, free of obstructions. We can adequately ventilate, um, get sufficient oxygen into the patient with no obstructions or nothing hindering that process. So... We're going to go over four components of respiration. They're basically pulmonary ventilation, uh, which is simply ventilating or breathing, in, um, which is the mechanical process of moving air in and out of the lungs. And then we have the external respiration, which is basically the gas exchange process that occurs between the alveoli and the surrounding pulmonary capillaries. Um, so as far as external respiration goes, it's also referred to as capillary gas exchange, and it basically serves to oxygenate the blood and eliminate CO2 in the lungs. As far as internal respiration goes, um, we're going to talk about this basically the gas exchange process that occurs between the cells and the systemic capillaries themselves. So internal respiration is also known as capillary gas exchange also and is responsible for delivering oxygen to the cells and uh, removing CO2 as well from the cell itself versus external respiration, we're getting rid of it from the lungs, okay? So internal respiration is getting rid of CO2 at a cellular level and external respiration is getting CO2 at the organ level, all right? And then cellular respiration is basically known as aerobic metabolism, okay? And it occurs in the cell. The process basically breaks down sugar or glucose um, along with oxygen and produces high amounts of energy in the body, which is known as a form of ATP. And given when that happens, that release of ATP actually causes the body to produce heat, release carbon dioxide, and sweat or produce water. Uh, as far as the upper airway goes, um, basically nose, mouth, and cricoid cartilage is really all that we need to worry about. As far as an unresponsive patient, the tongue is the primary number one reason that the airway gets obstructed, which can cause altered mental status um, when the relaxation of the tongue occurs because it tend, it, the tongue is a muscle. So when it relaxes, it falls back over the epiglottis, occluding the airway, causing the patient to basically suffocate. All right, so we're just kind of going over this chart you're in your book. So if you're following along in your book, uh, book, please be aware of what you're seeing. These are just kind of the more common structures that you're going to see in the airway as far as the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, which includes the tonsils, adenoids, and uvula, which a lot of people have those taken out. The glottical opening, vocal cords, or the larynx, thyroid cartilage, cricoid membrane, which is where surgical crikes are done. Then you have the cricoid cartilage, which is what we do when we do the burp maneuver, which we'll talk about later in this lesson. And then the thyroid gland itself, which is responsible for regulating calcium production in the body. As far as the structures go, you're looking at the epiglottis, which if you look up here, it tends to be that very leafy-like little structure. So this right here is what you're seeing. All right, so when you swallow, it forces this epiglottis to slam shut because it's just kind of hovering there with that little ligament right there. Okay, so when you're looking at that particular thing, when you swallow, that epiglottis slams shut over the trachea. So you don't get food, water, water, and other particles down into the trachea, all right? And then as you breathe, the epiglottis lifts up, allowing air to pass over the vocal cords, which makes sound, okay? <clears throat> all right, so the lower airway basically extends from that cricoid cartilage that we just saw and talked about down to the alveoli. So looking here, here's your cricoid cartilage, all right, or your thyroid here. So the lower airway basically extends, extends from this cartilage here all the way down to the alveolar sacs down here in the lungs. The mechanics of ventilation in itself, inhalation is an active process. It actually takes energy 
to breathe. Okay, this basically draws air in by the way of the nose, mouth, and then down in the trachea, bronchi, into the lungs until the pressure inside the lungs is equal to the atmospheric pressure outside the body. Then chest expansion stops and then you exhale. Okay, so inhalation is an active process because it requires energy to contract the muscles in the chest to increase the chest size. Exhalation is a very passive process um, in some respiratory diseases affecting the lower airway such as asthma. Um, people tend to have difficult time moving air in and out of the lungs because of an increased resistance um, in the airways or a diseased lung for instance or diseased lung tissue. There's usually a loss of elasticity uh, recoil so basically when you take a deep breath the lungs won't recoil back so they lose that rubber band type elasticity to return to a normal shape and the chest wall and lungs because of trapped alveoli and basically air trapped in the alveoli. So the patient must contract their muscles not only to draw air into the lungs but also to force the air out. Okay so therefore both the inhalation and exhalation become an active process requiring energy which is why people with diseased lungs get tired because with a normal person you inhale active process creates energy when the atmospheric pressure inside and out as you see here okay you inhale when the atmospheric pressure outside matches the pressure on the inside of the chest inhalation stops and then exhalation is just a passive process the air gets pushed out however because there's no elasticity with diseased lungs that exhalatory process which normally is passive now becomes an active process because they have to physically exert energy to relax everything and get that chest to recoil in order to push the air out otherwise they have air trapping control the respiration basically the chemoreceptors continuously monitor levels of oxygen CO2 and the pH of the body which is 7.35 to 7.45 Okay, in the arterial blood and stimulated increase or decrease in impulses from the respiratory rhythm centers to control the rate and depth of the ventilation. All right, so the respiratory system responds primarily to change in CO2 levels. All right, so in patients with a category condition known as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the, con the carbon dioxide levels, all right, are in the arterial blood and is typically chronically elevated because of the disease process. So these patients actually convert over to what is called a hypoxic drive. So normally people like you or me who uh, don't have any diseases, syndromes like COPD, emphysema, asthma, all right, we are, our chemoreceptors are extremely sensitive to changes in carbon dioxide. So as it senses just the slightest increase in CO2, it's going to compensate by making us breathe faster to blow off that excess CO2 before it gets too high. With a COPD patient, they convert over and their chemoreceptors become sensitive to changes in oxygen. Okay, So you got to remember that slight difference and we'll get further into a hypoxic drive a little bit later into this lecture. As far as oxygenation, this is a process which the blood and the cells become saturated with oxygen. This happens because of internal and external respiration, which is the process in which fresh oxygen replaces wasted CO2. Um, so muscle metabolism, just energy in general, that one of the waste products of aerobic metabolism is CO2, which is going to trap itself in the pulmonary system, and unless we can breathe that out, we're going to retain it, which can make us acidic. So as a gas exchange, that takes place between the alveolar sacs and the capillaries in the lungs, and then between the capillaries and the cells throughout the body. Um, as far as hypoxemia, this typically occurs from a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay, something's not right, something's off, so they're not equal. So because of this, we're becoming hypoxic, or what they call hypoxemia, all right, which is basically low oxygen concentration at an arterial blood level. So the ventilation perfusion mismatch occurs when there is a lack of available oxygen, all right, even through perfusion to the alveoli is adequate or when the alveoli are adequately oxygenated, but for some reason perfusion to the alveoli is poor, which would be low blood pressure, okay, or somebody goes into a shocky kind of appearance or a shocky kind of state such as hypovolemic shock or cardiogenic shock it's going to affect this ventilation perfusion mismatch, okay? 
or when there's a combination of both poor ventilation and poor perfusion at the alveolar and capillary structures. So signs of some mild to some moderate hypoxia. One of the key words that we're really going to be looking for is basically restlessness. But you're also going to see some tachypnea, some dyspnea, pale, cool, clammy skin, some tachycardia. Elevation in the blood pressure is going to go up slightly. Some restlessness and agitation from the brain cells becoming hypoxic. And then you're going to have a little bit of disorientation and confusion as well. All right. So we're looking for... Um, restlessness, head bobbing, sleepy type appearance. All right. When we go into a severe hypoxic state, these are going to be more prominent, more obvious. And then we're going to add to that severe confusion, loss of coordination, a very sleepy kind of appearance from the high CO2 levels. Okay. And then the head is going to start bobbing because they're going to start losing consciousness. They're going to start falling asleep. Eyelids are going to get droopy, very slow reaction time altered mental status, and if bad enough, can even progress into seizures. All right, so we got some conjunctiva cyanosis, which is if you pull the eyelids down, you'll see that there. You got some cyanosis to the mucosa, which is the lips, nail, uh, lips, gums, and tongue. And then you get your fingernail bed cyanosis and circumoral cyanosis, which is around the mouth. All right, so in infants and children, hypoxia can result in bradycardia, which is a very late sign instead of tachycardia because of the way that their body works. So in infants and young children normally have higher heart rates than adults. So as an example, a heart rate of 80, okay, which is normal in an adult, may be an indication of hypoxia in a week old infant because their heart rate is 100 to 180 normally. So when they drop down below that, that could be a sign that this particular child or infant is bradycardic and therefore hypoxic. All right. Newborns um, suspect hypoxemia as a cause of a slower than expected heart rate because this is a primary cause of bradycardia in this particular group of um, age group of kids. So it's really important to assess for early signs of hypoxia. The skin will become pale, cool, and clammy. You can also find tachypnea and tachycardia with these also. You may also find that the early changes in the mental status may occur in the form of restlessness or they could be a little agitated, maybe some confusion you'll see there also. And those are basically causes of buildup in CO2 in the blood which is going to cause the patient to become very, very confused. All right. So if they display any of these signs whatsoever, you need to immediately assess the airway, adequacy of their breathing. Do I have chest rise and fall? All right. Do I have an adequate rate and rhythm? And if not, I need to intervene immediately with a non-rebreather, even possibly even more than that, and think possibly about positive pressure ventilation by using a BVM. Okay. The blood moving in and out of the capillaries um, is usually deoxygenated blood. That is, it has a low O2 concentration, but very high in CO2. So the oxygen diffuses from those alveoli okay, into the capillaries. So when that happens, because the capillaries basically are full of CO2, all right, but not as much oxygen because of waste products and uh, aerobic metabolism, we inhale, we take all that oxygen into the lungs, so we have a bunch of oxygen sitting in the alveolar sacs. Because of that difference in levels between CO2 and oxygen, diffusion is going to occur and it's going to pull the oxygen through the membrane attached to the cells and then the CO2 is going to offload back into the alveolar sac so we can actually breathe it out. So hemoglobin, which is found in the cytoplasm of red blood cells, is responsible for picking up most oxygen in the blood, approximately about 97%. So when you put somebody on a little pulse oximeter and it reads about 97%, it's just reading that that particular hemoglobin cell is saturated 97% of something, okay? And it's carrying it through the arterial system to the capillaries through the body, right? And then the CO2 is exhaled from the alveoli and out of the lungs back into the atmosphere. All right, so as far as the cells have high levels of CO2 and low levels of oxygen from normal metabolism, okay, and again, because oxygen and carbon dioxide move from areas of high concentration to those of low concentration, the oxygen moves out of the capillaries and into the cells, and the carbon dioxide moves out of the cells and then back into the capillaries. Just kind of a really quick diagram. Again, if you're following along in your book, you'll see this down there um, in your book as well.
All right, severe alteration in perfusion can also cause a severe decrease in glucose delivery to the cells. All right, without a fuel source, the cells fail to produce energy and eventually will die. Okay, they become acidic, they start to produce acid, which is referred to as an anaerobic metabolism. So you have an insufficient energy production, buildup of acid, and then because of that buildup of acid inside the cell, the cell dysfunctions, ruptures, dies. All right, so let's see. Interruption of the nervous system's control and stimulation of the diaphragm or of the external intercostal muscles can result um, in brain injury, either from drugs that depress the central nervous system or from neuromuscular diseases such as muscular dystrophy. Um, so with these diseases, you get structural damage um, to the thorax itself, which can interfere um, with the action of the chest, so that in and out and that contraction and relaxation of the chest wall. Um, so it impedes the ability of the thorax to generate pressure, which changes um, necessary to draw air into the lungs for inhalation and then allows airflow out of the lungs um, during exhalation. All right, so increased airway resistance as a result of the diseases we discussed a second ago can reduce airflow through the respiratory tract and reduces the amount of air in the alveoli. This basically makes less oxygen available for gas exchange. These patients tend to suffocate. They feel like they can't catch their breath. They become pale and cyanotic a lot quicker. Um, disruption of the airway patency can occur from swelling caused from an infection, possibly an allergic reaction. Um, airway burns, okay, trauma to the airway itself, um, foreign body obstruction, you know, somebody swallowed something, um, or just from loss of muscle tone um, due to altered mental status or unresponsiveness. When you become unresponsive or altered, the peristalsis or the ability that gag reflex can be diminished or even absent. So then if something gets into that airway, you can't get it out. So loss of the patient's ability to be able to protect their own airway can cause problems. A reduction in the amount of oxygen content in the ambient atmosphere decreases the available oxygen for gas exchange in the alveoli and at the cell level, leading to basically what they call cellular hypoxia. Um, the oxygen content can be reduced by toxic gases or an enclosed space without adequate ventilation. Um, so things such as pneumonia, pulmonary edema, or drowning can cause fluid to fill the alveolar sacs, collapse those, and then increase the space between the alveoli and the capillaries, all of which hinder the movement of oxygen and CO2 between. So you can't exchange gas through fluid, all right? Other diseases such as emphysema, they basically distort the structure of the air sacs or the alveoli and change the surface area for effective gas exchange, right? They can't expand, contract, all right? And another cause of some cellular hypoxia is poor perfusion, which is what we call either pale, cool, diaphoretic, hypotension, all right? Such as pulmonary embolus, tension pneumothorax, heart failure, cardiac tamponade, all right? Reduce of the delivery of oxygenated blood to the cells. Other conditions such as anemia, hypovolemia reduce the concentration of red blood cells. Red blood cells carry hemoglobin, okay? Hemoglobin carries oxygen. So if we have a deficient amount of hemoglobin production in the body, they're already going to be at a disadvantage because lack of hemoglobin, lack of oxygen, they're gonna get winded, they're gonna feel bad, they're gonna start to feel like they're short-winded much quicker than somebody who is not anemic. Chest wall pliability, as far as infants and children go, we got to think about what are the differences in pediatric systems as compared to adults, okay? They have a bigger increased reliance on that diaphragm. So these patients, the younger patients, they rely more on that diaphragmatic muscle to be able to breathe. Plus their chest wall is extremely pliable. They haven't really calcified and don't have those rigid ribs yet. So they're very easily overinflated with artificial and ventilation, which is why it's very important that you keep that in mind that when you're going to ventilate a child or an infant that you're using the appropriate bag valve mask and not an adult BVM on an infant because you will overinflate the lungs and cause barotrauma. The mouth and nose is basically smaller than those of adults. 
Um, so they're more easily obstructed by just the smallest of objects. So an infection can cause severe swelling that might just cause a cough reaction in us but can completely occlude the airway in children. Um, so infants are basically obligate nose breathers, meaning that they want to breathe through the nose and not the mouth. Thus, it is especially important to keep the nose clear of obstructions. So kids like to stick Legos and little things up their nose or they're full of mucus due to their being, um, having being sick or just the flu or anything like that. These patients, you've got to keep that nose clear because they want to breathe through their nose first. As far as the pharynx goes, because the tongue is of an infant or child is relatively larger in proportion to the size of the mouth, it can cause a huge obstruction, okay? The epiglottis can protrude into the pharynx, also contributing to obstruction from something they call epiglottitis, which is an infection of the epiglottis. Trachea lower airway um, in infants is much narrower. It's also a lot softer, more flexible than those of adults. So you have to think, when you try to do head tilt chin lift, if you hyperextend that neck, you're actually going to occlude the airway versus open it up. All right. The cricoid cartilage, all right, in infants and children is less developed and very less rigid. All right. So in less than 10 years of age, the cricoid cartilage is typically the narrowest portion of the upper airway. The chest wall in an infant or child is much more pliable leads to much greater compliance, elasticity, response to pressure, or movement during ventilation. Infants and children rely more on the diaphragm to breathe, as we discussed before. The intercostal muscles contribute less because they're not developed yet in breathing and act more like accessory muscles. So when that diaphragm gets tired and they can't really breathe, they're not taking in good breaths, that diaphragm starts to get tired. That's when we start to see retractions between the ribs, what they call intercostal retractions. All right, so that costal space between the ribs, those muscles start to suck in because they're not developed yet. So they're easily used as accessory muscles when that diaphragm gets tired. Patients with ultra mental status are very susceptible to airway obstruction as well as aspiration. All right, because if they're altered, that gag reflex is also altered, so they can't protect and cough up what's causing an obstruction. All right, so no matter what the patient's condition, the airway must always remain open at all costs. All right. When you encounter things like this, it can be different to find the airway. All right, so we got these burns all over this patient's face, and then we have over here. Where is the throat? Where is the trachea? All right. So we have to keep in mind when we have things like this that come up, these are those special considerations that we were talking about. Some upper airway sounds that you might hear, um, basically snoring respirations are basically an obstruction by the tongue, and it can be relaxed tissue in the pharynx also. Um, the snoring obstruction can be corrected by simply a head tilt chin lift, um, in a patient with spinal trauma, use a jaw thrust. As far as crowing, it sounds like a crow, cawing, all right? Um, basically, the muscles around the larynx spasm, and they're narrow and causing an opening in the trachea. Air rushes through the restricted passage, causing that particular crowing sound. Um, another sound you might hear is gurgling, which kind of sounds like you're gargling mouthwash, all right? But you hear it down in the upper airway, like in the trachea. You can actually hear this as you approach the patient without really having to use a stethoscope and listen. And basically, it's liquid in the airway, okay? Strider is a very um, harsh, high-pitched sound, usually heard during inspiration. So it's basically characterized as significant upper airway obstruction, it could be from swelling or a mechanical obstruction. They swallowed something, it got lodged in there, it's turned the wrong way, kind of like a flap on a carburetor. And it can also be heard if a mechanical obstruction by food kind of acts like I was talking about that carburetor, how when you rev a carburetor, the flap opens up, it's stuck in there, but only a little bit of air causes you to be able to hear that loud kind of high-pitched noise that you're getting. Opening the mouth, basically head tilt chin lift with non-traumatic patients and jaw thrust with trauma patients. We try to use a cross finger technique if possible, all right, and we're going to do manual maneuvers, all right, head tilt chin lift, jaw thrust maneuver, inserting mechanical airways such as an oral pharyngeal airway or a nasal pharyngeal airway, 
And then if there's fluid in the airway whatsoever, we suction. Because remember, the airway always, no matter what, has to be clear. <clears throat> Head tilt chin lift, no spinal injury like we said, basically unresponsive patients, possibly cardiac arrest. This is what you're going to, you know, use these patients, these maneuvers for. Basically, no fall, no signs of trauma, all right? Basically, you're going to put your hand on the forehead, put two fingers under the chin, and you're going to tilt the head back and lift up on the chin, causing that head tilt motion that you see right here, all right? Careful not to put your fingers too far or dig too much into that soft tissue under the chin because you can actually push the tongue to the roof of the mouth and actually occlude the airway. With infants, you really have to be careful with this because remember a few slides back we were discussing that the airway for infants is still qu quite pliable and quite um, flexible and soft. So hyperextending or overextending that airway on infants, all right, as you see here, can actually cause a complete obstruction of that airway. So with an infant, the head should be tilted back gently into what they call a sniffing or a neutral position. Sometimes doing a head tilt chin lift manually with your hands can actually cause a problem, can cause overexertion. So an easy way to do it might be to just throw a towel up underneath the shoulders, which will naturally put that neck into that sniffing or that neutral inline position and give us the open airway that we need. All right, so with a jaw thrust maneuver, Basically, this actually hurts if you do it on an actual live person. It's quite uncomfortable. As you see here, the fingers go right behind that jawline. So if you feel that jawline on yourself right now, you can feel, as you can see right here, those fingers go just under where that jawline curves in and head towards the ear. you got to put that space between the earlobe and the, where the jaw curves. That's where those four fingers go. And then your thumbs are going to go right here, as you can see. They're going to go right on either side of the mouth between that, that space, between the mouth and the chin. You're going to pull up with your fingers, pull up in this direction towards the ceiling, and then push towards the feet with your thumbs, and that is what's called a jaw thrust maneuver. Okay, It's actually quite painful when you do it on somebody um, alert, and it can cause some discomfort. But with these unconscious patients who you suspect trauma, you may actually dislocate the jaw, but that airway needs to be open. It is crucial that you get that airway open, especially if you hear snoring respirations because that jaw thrust maneuver is going to help lift that tongue away from the back of the throat and allow you to be able to bag this patient. All right, so as far as opening the airway in infants, it's a little bit different, much smaller structures. And again, you still have to be really, really, really careful. But keep in mind, if this patient is awake at all, this is painful. So you only need to do this if you absolutely need to, if you suspect trauma, okay? Uh, 